The San Francisco Public Library presents part two of a conversation with Thomas Fleming, writer and co-founder of The Sun Reporter, San Francisco's African-American weekly newspaper. Welcome to the San Francisco Public Library to part two of who knows, with the new millennium coming up, maybe a long, ongoing series with Mr. Fleming, um, because he keeps us engaged and he reminds us of things that we may have forgotten or never knew. And he has been with us so long and done so much and experienced so much that it's always worth taking time to listen to him and experience life through his eyes. It's just been wonderful for me having the opportunity to know him, and I appreciate the fact that he was willing to come back to the library and do this again. Um, my name is Daphne Holmes, and I'm with the Office of Exhibitions and Programming. And I welcome you on behalf of that office, as well as the Friends and Foundation of the San Francisco Public Library, without whom we could not do this type of programming that people seem to enjoy so much. We have today um, a number of things on the table to the right of you at the back of the room, materials for sale about Mr. Fleming, his new book, his earlier piece, uh, some t audio tapes, all of which are available for purchase. We also have some literature from the library of upcoming events and programs that you might be interested in. And then there's another table outside as well with some of the library information and additional information. Uh, two things that I wanted to bring to your attention before we get started is that upstairs on the sixth floor, the Shades of San Francisco um, Western Edition branch photography show is wonderful. Take an opportunity to see it. It will be up through March 25th. It gives you another aspect of the history that Mr. Fleming discusses um, here today and in his prior programs here at the library and at other locations. And we will be doing another photo day for Shades of San Francisco, focusing on the mission area. And so there's flyers and information about that on the tables. And I encourage you, if you lived in that area, know people and so forth, to have them participate, because it's, it's just a wonderful thing to see history unfold in that way. For February, our large screen videos in the Corret Auditorium, which happen every month, Thursday at noon, on February 4th, The Black Press, Soldiers Without Swords. February 11th, Richard Wright, Black Boy. February 18th, James Baldwin, The Price of the Ticket. February 25th, we'll have a double bill, For My People, The Life and Writing of Margaret Walker, and Toni Morrison, Profile of a Writer. Again, these are all free and open to the public, and I hope you will be able to, able to attend. Today, Mr. Fleming, is still writing, still sharing his experiences and thoughts with us. He is the co-founder, uh, 1944, of The Sun Reporter, uh, Northern California's largest weekly African-American newspaper. He continues to write uh, articles for the paper from his home, in addition to his syndicated column, Reflections in Black History. He was born in Jacksonville, Florida in 1907. Uh, raised by his grandmother, who he believes was a former slave. He lived in New York before he moved to Chico, California in 1919. In uh, 1944, he was one of the founding editors of the Republic, of the Reporter, rather, which later merged with another black paper, The Sun, to become The Sun Reporter. And for almost 50 years, The Sun Reporter was published by his close friend, the late Dr. Carlton Goodlett. In July of 97, Mr. Fleming retired as an executive editor to The Sun Reporter to concentrate on his memoirs. And the culmination of those are those books that he and Max Millard have been putting out um, for a couple of years now. And I hope that you've had a chance to look at them and to purchase them. Today in conversation with Mr. Fleming is Max Millard, who worked with him at The Sun Reporter for about two years before they realized that they had an incredible project that they needed to pursue. and so. Max will be interviewing, talking with, I should say, more of a conversation than an interview with Mr. Fleming this afternoon. We will be doing question and answers, and um, hope that you will enjoy the afternoon. Max? Thank you, Daphne. I regret that I'm not Noah Griffin, for those who were hoping to see him here. I have the highest regard for Noah, and he's been very supportive of this column and the books and the speeches 
So uh, he happens to be in Washington, D.C. this week, so he asked me to take his place. Well, whenever I talk to Noah, then he refers to Mr. Fleming as the voice of history. I think that's a wonderful title. And a few days ago, when the Carlton, Dr. Carlton B. Goodlett Place was dedicated, I think you see that that's no exaggeration because Dr. Goodlett was Thomas Fleming's best friend for going all the way back to 1935. So Thomas, to start with, I'd like to ask you about when you first met Dr. Goodlett and what were your impressions? Carlton uh, graduated from Howard University in the spring of 1935. He came, out to, he came to Berkeley in the fall of 1945 to enter graduate school. His original plans was to enroll in the master's degree program on a Berkeley campus. Well, I was in a pressing and cleaning shop one day on Ashby Avenue listening to football game. I was a University of California, very rabid football fan. <laughs> I followed the Golden Bears very closely, although they never did have too many winning seasons. And Carlton came in this pressing in this cleaning shop, and a man who operated was a man who lived in Omaha before he came to California, because uh, Goodlett, like me, was born in Florida, and his family went to Nebraska instead of coming to California like my mother did. And so uh, he came in, the, uh, walking in there, had on this uh, suede jacket, had bison uh, written on the back of it. I think that's the, the, uh, the team name for the Howard University athletic teams. And he's very cocky when he walked in. And, and uh, Macklin and I was uh, cooking some, uh, I mean, heating up some, uh, that, uh, a couple of cans of Italian American <laughs> uh, Mac, uh, spaghetti, and we had about a dozen Rennies we'd bought we'd put in there. We were going to eat because he had this uh, coal oil stove in the back of his place. So he, well, he uh, Carl, I noticed Carl walking in and how, how cocky he walked, so I thought to myself, so who in the heck is this cat come out here from Howard University? Who in the hell do he think he is? And he's asking a lot of questions, so he looks down at me and he says, uh, uh, he says, how long have you been around here? I says, I came to California in 1919. So I was talking to Macklin about coming over to San Francisco on the weekends, because I had a friend who was a mailman over here who gave me his commute tickets for every Friday and Saturday because the ferries were still running there. They, I, I don't, uh, I don't, well, they, they might have started the bridge in 35. Well, uh, so I was telling Macklin I was coming over to San Francisco because I had, had these, these, these free tickets. So he says, you going over to San Francisco? I said, yes. He says, uh, well, uh, why don't you ride over with me? He said, I'm going to drive over. And he says, uh, he gave me a phone number out in Berkeley. So I called that phone number the ne that Sunday morning, and I, and, uh, I didn't get any answer. So I got to use my commute tickets and came on over to San Francisco, where I joined a, a friend of mine, incidentally, it was Klein Wilson. I was his best man when he got married in 1936, I think it was, at Third Baptist Church. He and his wife are sitting here. So, uh, uh, I came on over the next day on the campus. I was standing up there, up, uh, you know, between Wheeler, uh, uh, between Wheeler, Wheeler Hall and, and the library. And Goodluck come rushing up there and says, God damn, I thought you told me he was coming, coming over with me. I said, well, I, I said, uh, I couldn't find you. So uh, he said, why didn't you ask to operate about it by, the, by the, the, the address? I said, I didn't think about that. And I said, I had tickets, so I came on over to San Francisco. So that's when he asked me again, how long you live here? You know, I said, I, I repeated it again. He says, well, maybe you know some nice people living here, some family people. He said, the guys I go over to see, said, all they do is drink a lot of booze on weekends and play poker. And he said, I'd like to meet some nice people. So I said, OK, meet me after uh, about 3 o'clock this afternoon. So I took him down to a friend of mine's house who uh, was an attorney over there. He, uh, in fact, I guess he was the most successful black attorney in, in Northern California then, uh, Leonard Richardson. I see another old friend here, probably knew Leonard Richardson, uh, Josephine uh, 
uh, Cole, she's the first black teacher hired here in San Francisco. Stand up, Joe. <laughs> so uh, I took him by Lynn's house, and I walked in the house. I knew the people, they were like family. I mean, he walked right in behind me. I wa walked back to the kitchen. He came in there, too. And Lynn's wife was sitting there. Lynn's wife was, uh, uh, was having her hair done at home by Lynn's sister. So she just had a slip on. Well, you know, I was like family. So when Carlton walks in there, she jumped up and started screaming. He said, what the hell are you screaming about? I said, you ain't the first woman I've seen dressed in a slip only. <laughs> and then we started going there from then on. And uh, we went everywhere together. Uh, the, the three years is over here. And I, I forgot to mention, when he came out here, as I told you earlier, he was going to work for the master's degree program. After he got out here at Berkeley, he decided to take the comprehensive for the PhD in psychology, and damn if he didn't do it. Did it in three years. He was 23 years old when he got his doctorate over in Berkeley. And he was always in a hurry. <laughs> we always uh, walked very fast, and, and uh, our, our uh, young uh, male black doctor over there named Legrand Coleman up and said, What's, what's he hiring so far? What's he running so much for Tom? I said, I don't know. Uh, because he would sit up and study all night, because I used to go up to the Institute of Child Welfare. I was taking some classes at Berkeley then myself. I would conk out about 2 o'clock in the morning. I'd come on down where, you know, where, where I had a room in another part of Berkeley. Well, Carlton was living up at I House, right off the campus, International House, what they call I House. And uh, so... In, in three years, he accomplished his goal. That's when I met his mother. She, uh, he sent for her. Well, one of the things he did was in 1936 when the, when the brand new Chevrolets came out here because he drove out here in a Chevrolet, a 1934 car. He decided he was going to get a new car. So he t trades that car in and uh, buys a brand new one. And he told me, he said, if my old man knew I was buying, buying a, new, a new car, he said he'd start working in the slaughterhouse in Omaha and come out here and go to school too. <laughs> 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 so uh, I met his mother when she came. And in those days, uh, the commencement at, at Davis, the medical school over here, and all of Berkeley, held their ceremonies over at the Memorial Stadium, the football stadium on the Berkeley campus. Well, uh, the seniors from med school and from, from Davis who were going to get their, their, their diploma came down to Berkeley. It, it was a huge affair because even then, uh, well, uh, then Davis was just called the College of, of, of Agriculture. It wasn't called the University of California at Davis. Over here it was called the College of Medicine, not the University of California at San Francisco. So uh, when Goodlett, uh, uh, they called Goodlett's name out there, I was sitting up in the stadium with his mother. He ran across there to get that diploma. I said, that cat's still in a hurry, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so he got a job teaching uh, at West Virginia State University uh, that first year. And of course, he got in some problems after he got there because he was only 24 then. And, and I don't think there were very many other PhDs on the campus. And Goodall was at the age where he could mingle very freely with the students. He stayed there for a year, and then they left. They got rid of him. So that's when he decided he'd go, go into med school and go into pediatrics, because he got his, his PhD in child psychology. So he went to uh, enter FIS that, that next fall. I mean, not FIS. He was doing some work at Fisk and going to Meharry, taking classes in, in, the, in the medical school. The man who was president of, uh, of Fisk, Fisk at that time was Charles S. Johnson. Some of you might have heard his name. He was a dis distinguished black sociologist who taught at Howard and later became president of Fisk University. And uh, so he knew Charles because when he was an undergraduate at, at, at Howard, Charles found something for him to do that fish so he could earn, earn some money. So uh, while he was there, he got married because I got money. Matter of fact, we wrote to one another every week to seven years he was gone from here. We talked about the same things we used to talk about here. 
when he was a student out here about what girls was going on, what was happening. I kept him well informed. <laughs> so uh, when the war, after, after Pearl Harbor and, and, the, and the black population showed that started growing so much, I started telling him then, I said, man, this is the place to come. I said, because blacks are pouring out here by the thousands. Well, at the time when he was out here as, an un as a graduate student, he didn't like California. He said, this was the last frontier. I, he didn't think much it was out here. And I looked at him with skeptical eyes. I said, because, heck, you just came from down in Florida, up, up to Omaha, and Omaha was a frontier town, too. Because it sounded funny to me, him saying that, about the uh, city of Farmo Cosmopolitan, uh, the uh, Farmo Cosmopolitan, Omaha. Well. The Army grabbed me after we started the, 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 the reporter the, in 1944. A man named Frank Logan put up the money. I had worked for the Oakland Tribune for a, work, a short while. I had done that, that radio program over another side for a short while called Activities Among Negroes. And uh, I had worked for the spokesman over here. A friend of mine I met when he was a graduate student at Berkeley started the spokesman. Well, uh, John was a, he was a communist and never to try to hide it. So, uh, but I used to write for him some. Because I, I know when, when uh, well, John was so radical, they used to call us the little people's world. I don't know how many of you recall the people's world. That was the daily communist paper over here. He used to call us the daily people's world. So uh, when, the, when the strike happened in 34, we started writing editorial supporting the striking workers, although I knew a lot of my, my friends over there in Berkeley, a lot of students even, came over here to work because they were paying, I think, 75 cents an hour then. <laughs> and in 34, that was a lot of money, and you could work as many hours as you want. The ship owners would put a, a dock one ship over there, which they serve as a dormitory ship. You could eat on there and sleep on there, and uh, and, and then work as many hours as you want. Well, the enterprising gentleman I know, I uh, used to call, it, call himself John L. Bertone. I think Eddie Eddy knows him. He promoted dances over there at Sweet's Ballroom in Oakland. He came over here and with, uh, with, a, uh, with a pair of friendly dice. That's what he came over here. And they used to have some of the biggest crap games I heard on that dormitory ship you've ever seen. And Johnny stayed over here about three weeks, and he come back. He was quite independent, I know. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so when, uh, so when, the, so I was writing for that. Well, uh, uh, as I told uh, during the strike, we were supporting the strikers. There were some vigilantes going around the Bay Area here. They were beating up some people. I don't know who they were, but they were beating pe people up. They thought they were anti-union, anti and uh, particularly if they caught any scabs, because I remember one night I heard the guys talking about it so much over in Berkeley, I came down. They said a truck would meet, meet, meet us down at uh, 35th and uh, San Pablo, so a bunch of us came down from Berkeley, were sitting there waiting for this, this truck to come by. Well, a truck did come by, but all them, them, them longshoremen jumped up armed with baseball bats and everything, and they started swinging as soon as they got off, and we started running. And I never did try, to, try that again. I, I was a little bit too risky. risky. I didn't think that, uh, even though the, the, the money was good at that time, uh, but that's the only time I ever tried uh, scabbing. Well, I did it because there were a lot of students at Berkeley doing the same thing because uh, it, they could come over here and earn enough money to take care of, a, of a, almost a whole semester because that time Berkeley, you know what the tuition was over at Berkeley? $26 a semester. And if you join the student body, that's $10. $36 a semester, then you had to get your books and get a place to live. Well, I knew when I was, at uh, the time when I was, uh, you know, a student over there, I was paying two fifty dollars a week and got, getting two meals out of it. So that, that money seemed pretty good over here. So, uh, well, we, uh, uh, we, the, the, the spokesman drew the ire of some right-wing people, who I guess they were, we never knew who they were, but they came by one night, 
in our office, we had one linotype machine. We set our own type and then took everything to the printers to get it done. And uh, we had one linotype on the storefront building was at the corner of, of uh, Baker and Sutter, yeah, Baker and Sutter Street. Some of the vigilantes came by there one night and broke out of plate glass windows. They got inside the place, smashed up the keyboard on the linotype machine, and wrote notes all over there telling us, you niggas go back to Africa. I guess they didn't like our editorials. <laughs> but we prevail even that uh, until the war came. And then uh, by the time uh, 1940 came by, John ran out of money and, you know, that effort. So John did go to work for the People's World. I think he was the managing editor of the People's World when he came to work for them. But uh, I continued to see him then and uh, after that. So uh, when the war started, I started, uh, you know, they had blackouts out here on the West Coast too. And I thought about World War I. I was living in New York City. And World War came, and if some of you remember, the, the Germans were bombing London then from there with the, those derisions, the, the they called it the Zeppelins. And there was a lot of speculation in the New York papers then that uh, the Germans were going to fly across the Atlantic and bomb New York City, too. Well, my dad was quite a prankster. He came in that bed. We lived in a, in a tenement there. I think it was five floors. He hit the first floor and started yelling, Germans over New York, <laughs> all those black hollows. Everybody come pouring out of the building. But they come out and found they want to get my old man scalped. But he got into his apartment and stayed inside. <laughs> Then, I, you know, in 1940, there were blackouts here in, along the Pacific Coast because there were rumors that the Japanese was going to bombard you know, the, 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 the Pacific Coast. So I saw two blackouts in, in two cities on each coast in my lifetime during uh, two world wars. Well, I went to work. Uh, I, uh, I started taking them when I saw the direction the country moved. I, I, they started, uh, 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 President Roosevelt seemed to be aware of what, would, what we might get into one day. So they started spending a lot of federal money. You know, they started opening up shipyards even before we got into it. And they started offering our uh, defense training courses. Technical high school, the machine shop over there is where I, and up there, WPA was furnishing, uh, supplying the money for that, and I enrolled in the machinist program. And after Pearl Harbor came, I'd been, I'd been in, uh, taking that program for about a year. After Pearl Harbor came, I got a job up at Maryland in the Navy Yard as a third class machinist, although I didn't know, didn't know, uh, know any, much, any more about being a machinist than I do now, and I didn't know anything <laughs> before then. <laughs> But you could get by because they would put you on one machine, one machine and you'd learn how to operate that, and that's all you did in there anyway. So I was off, uh, one Sunday I was standing at the, uh, standing at the corner of Post and, uh, and Fillmore, and I met a man there named Frank Morgan, uh, Frank Logan, someone introduced me to him, and he had been uh, successful in business here in, 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 in San Francisco, out there in the Western Edition. And he's taught my starting a, a newspaper. So uh, a, friend, uh, a friend of his whom I'd met, they both came from Texas, introduced me to him. So he found out that I had had some experience on newspapers because even before the spokesman, I wrote uh, for uh, both the Wildcat at Chico State University. That was the name of the paper up then, there then. Because as I tell everybody, I went to every school in Chico, grammar school, high school in Chico State. Uh, and then before that, I wrote on the, the red, uh, the red, uh, red and gold. That was the paper at, at, at Chico High School. I used to write humor columns then. And uh, so I told Logan about, about my experience, and he said, well, "You want to work in, on this with me?" I said, "Yeah." So that's when the reporter started. That was with us for the first issue, and. Uh, I started writing article, writing editorials in there about uh, protesting uh, the transit system over in Oakland, which was called the key system. They operated uh, the free cars and the buses over across the bay, and also the ferries in competition with the Southern Pacific. The Southern Pacific had a 
must have had about 20 ferry boats in the bay. The key system had about four boats. But the key had this advantage over, over the SP. The SP had to go all the way over to Oakland to the Oakland Mole. The key had their dock out there almost out of Treasure Island. It came out, they, 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 their, their tracks came out over Trestle all the way from mainland out to the, uh, you know, where the docks were. And uh, they'd crossed the bay much faster than, and they were uh, newer boats too because most of their boats were diesel. And the SB had them old paddle wheelers and side wheelers and all those, uh, all the other <laughs> types of vessels they used during steam, you know, steam, steam days on ships. And uh, so I started to work for Frank, and then I was noticing that the key system wasn't hiring any blacks. The uh, the Muni was hiring blacks, even the Market Street Railway, because that was before the city bought out the, the uh, bought out the. The Market Street Railway, railway, and uh, incidentally, the uh, Josephine Cole's husband was the first black man hired to operate a streetcar in San Francisco. Stand up, Audley Cole, so they can see you. <laughs> and because of that, nobody wanted to train him because he's black. Only one man agreed to take him out to tell him how to. Start and stop a damn streetcar. <laughs> and the rest of them drove him away from the Muni then and turned him into a hopeless drunk. Because <laughs> after we started, after I started the reporter, he used to come by there almost every day talking to me. <laughs> well, apparently my draft board didn't like, uh, uh, didn't like the editorials I was writing about the key system not hiring any black operators. Because I got greetings. I thought I was pretty safe then, because I was I was 37. They said they didn't want anyone over 35. Plus, I was supporting my mother. I thought that was a, <laughs> you know in my favor too. I got greetings, so I went by the draft. My draft book was in Emeryville, and I was talking to one of the clerks there. She says told me she thought that somebody didn't like the editorials. I didn't even know anybody read the Sun Reporter, but uh, I mean the Reporter, but blacks. <laughs> so. Uh, I made my plea, but it didn't do any good because they said, they told me when to report over here for for induction. So I came over, and I called my mother. I said, I said I'm not coming back home. I said you'll hear from me when I get wherever they're going to send me to. Well, I uh, and then the, of course my correspondence still continued with Carlton Goodall. I have to tell you that. When I went into the Army, Goodlett had just finished Meharry. He'd gone to a little town in Tennessee uh, called Columbia. He had, he had to practice medicine there before he could get represented represent, represent the, the, the practice here in the state of California. So I kept him aware, so he started telling me about things I could do to get out. I said, I done started something, man. I better not change my story. I told him I couldn't eat Army chow, so they kept putting me in out of the hospital. Because <laughs> I remember once, after I finished basic training at, at the Fort at Leonard Wood in Missouri, they sent me to Fort Francis Warren right outside of Cheyenne, Wyoming. And by that time, Goodlett had finished his year in Tennessee. He told me that he was going to come to California anyway and start practice, the practice of medicine. He got to Omaha. He told me he was going to leave there on a, on a Monday night driving to California. He changed his mind and left Omaha on a Sunday night. Well, after they kicked me out of the hospital, then I was still going over to the hospital because the feds had been over there, and I stayed hit, hit out over in the, <laughs> in the hospital every day, all day long until the, well, all the duty hours had gone by. So I came over to, my, to the barracks there and got, got my mail, and I, I was writing very steady to a young lady. She happened to be Dr. Daniel Collins' assistant, or she's teaching down in West Virginia. Uh, so I would write to her every day and write to Goodland every day, and then uh, Gussie, uh, that was her name, Augusta James, she couldn't get get cigarettes, it was hard, so I could get a cartoon of cigarettes a week. I was buying the cigarettes and sending them to her in West Virginia. So that that particular Monday, why, uh, I'd gone over to the barracks, read Gussie's letter, and, and, and wrote her answer, and was coming over to the post office to, 
uh, uh, dropped uh, the letter in the mailbox, and I saw this gray car coming up, somebody leaning out the window shaking their fist like that. So when that car got close to me, Goodlett leaned out the window and says, God damn it, man, why in the hell don't you stay right around where somebody can find you? He says, I've been here ever since 7 o'clock this morning looking for you. And he had his wife with him. I'd never seen her yet. So I said, well, God damn it, I said, you told me to go get here Tuesday. This is, this is Monday. So he said, come on over and shake hands. Man, I ain't seen you in seven years. So we sat up all night long. The, uh, the, the black uh, uh, chaplain on the, on the post got a, a quarters for them to sleep in. They had what they call guest barracks there, uh, too. And uh, so I sat up all night talking with him. And uh, this is the first time I got drunk, because he had a couple of gin, a couple of bottles of gin in the car with him. First time I got drunk since I'd gone went into the army, and I've been in the army then about three months. So uh, he told me his plans, and I said, "Well, one of the guys in the hospital told me I was slated for discharge." Well, he came on here, and the first place he went by was to see my mother. I think she was sick. I think she took the bed right after I went went. Went in the army. I think she thought I was going to go overseas. And uh, so in, in August, uh, they told me I was uh, coming back to Camp Beale. That's right outside of Maris, uh, Marisville for a discharge. And then when I got to the depot there, they said the train was supposed to pass through uh, Cheyenne, I think, about 5 o'clock. You know that train didn't come by till about midnight, and I said, these cats are going to try to keep me in the army. I, I got real upset. <laughs> and I got, I got to Camp Beale uh, a day later. I was slated to come through there the day before, so uh, everybody else that came in the day I did, they were supposed to come, to, come through that day. They push, pushed them on. They made me go back and sleep in the same barracks I slept in, the, uh, you know, the first night I got there. They let these guys go in the ones I came in with. It kept me there, so I talked to the sergeant, and he said, you ain't been in the Army enough to be getting out, because it was six months. And so a lieutenant came by, and I asked him about that. He said, so he said, who told you you couldn't go uh, pass on? I pointed the sergeant out. He chewed that sergeant out. And he said, "You don't." This, he said, "This isn't your business. This is army business about how we how we handle personnel." Well, I was a day behind, and when uh, I think the second day I was there, uh, the the uh, the Germans stopped fighting. I was I was in Camp Beal when armistice start, uh, happened. And of course, I called my mother right away on the phone, and I got in the, oh, I got in three nights later. So when I got in, I asked my mother, the first thing I asked my mother, where are my clothes? She said, they're hanging up in the closet. I changed clothes right away. <laughs> my sister was out when she came in and said, oh, I'd like to see you in your uniform. I said, if you didn't see me when I came in, you ain't going to see me with that suit on anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas, I'd like to uh, move ahead a little bit. OK. Uh, when, when Dr. Goodlett uh, moved to San Francisco at that time. What was his first involvement with civil rights here? As soon as he got here, he became involved. Because he'd done a little of that over on the Berkeley campus, too, uh, when he was a graduate student over there. You know, in the students' union, they had the barber shop over there. They wouldn't serve black students over there. And so he got the black students together, and they protested so much they started cutting black students' hair on the campus. And ever since I've, I've known him, it looked like he'd been deeply committed to equality of opportunity, let's put it that way. He'd been uh, deeply committed to that. I don't think he ever sought anything for himself because, as he said, he never sought for an appointment for a job here after he got to San Francisco. He was always working to get blacks in the jobs where they hadn't been before. Because he looked at, looked at uh, uh, racism the same way Paul Robeson did. Equality of opportunity. They never asked for any more than that. Because uh, uh, Ross, Con uh, Ross Connolly fails to see that. But th there was inequality of opportunity. 
Because when he talked out so hard against affirmative action here in California, I couldn't understand where that cat was coming from. And he's a black man, too. And it became successful by, by getting a, a contract from the state of California under affirmative action. But it was all right for him to do it. And goodness, I've always been that way. That's one of the reasons why I guess we like one another like that. And uh, one, another reason why we had such admiration for, for, for Paul Robeson. Well, I'm, uh, you know, uh, Paul, I think everybody here was aware, aware of what happened to Paul Robeson and Dr. Boris. When they came out and let it known uh, uh, that they were opposed to racism the way they were, the first thing they did is take their passports away from them. Because Robeson uh, did more singing in Europe than he did here in, in this country. Because he knew how it was here in the United States. So uh, I was used to talk to Paul when he came here for, uh, at that time uh, when, when he didn't have any passport. The longshoreman brought him here. He said and they held a concert for him down in, in the Longshoreman Union. And then uh, Goodlett persuaded Dr. Haynes to let Robeson sing in his church. Because there were a lot of the black ministers were scared. They thought he was a communist. But we had convinced Haynes that, <coughs> that communists weren't, weren't devils. So, uh, any, and, and, and so Robeson sang there before he sang at the Longshoreman's Hall. And then he's persuaded him to let Dr. Dubois speak in his church. And uh, so, uh, and anyway, Paul and I used to stand out there on the corner of Fillmore instead of talking about the problem. Well, you know what I mean when I say the problem. Any, inequality of opportunity, let's put it that. That's what we were talking about. And, uh, and I asked him one time, now, I think many of you have probably been reading in the paper what them black kids had, what they call them zip guns in Harlem, uh, killing one another. And I asked Paul, I said, I said, I said why, why are those kids doing that, Paul? He said, they don't have any hope. So they locked in where they are. So I said, well, we got to work on that. All of us have. And uh, it, it, uh, so from then on, well, well, Paul gradually, he finally got his passport back. And, and so did Dr. Du Bois. And Dr. Du Bois went to, went to Europe because he said he was going to stay over there for the rest of his life. He went over and started compiling that, that uh, Encyclopedia Africanus. Incidentally, I read a long piece in the, in the New York Times this week that uh, Dr. Louis Gates at Harvard University, he's head of the Black Studies Department, is going to continue that, that encyclopedia Africanus. He's going to also add uh, video tapes with, it, with, with the work he's doing there. And I'm looking forward to that coming out because I, I'm getting old, but I'd like to see that before I leave here. And uh, so uh, I thought it was timely to mention that here because you can be on the lookout for it. Louis W. Gates. He's head of the Black Studies Department at Harvard University. Very brilliant man. Yeah, Thomas, uh, asking about Carlton Goodlett, what were some of the ways that he fought against racism here? Opening doors for, for black people to get, get jobs. Did he ever have any run-ins with the police with his attitude? Well, uh, I don't know whether exactly you could say attitude, uh, but he was driving out Gary Boulevard one Sunday, and uh, then he came, uh, oh, uh, the cops had later on, that he had followed him for about 15 blocks. He stopped for a red light somewhere out there, way out on Gary, and the cop uh, told him that he'd been speeding. See, he'd been following him for, about 20 blocks, so uh, Gunnar says, well, why didn't you stop me before now? So he says, uh, he looked in there and looked, you, you know where you have your, your license on, 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 your, on your steering wheel, you got his name, and he says, well, well, Carlton, he says, get out of the car. He says, my name is Dr. Gilder to you. Just like you, officer to me. And say, so you're going to respect me, so he grabbed Carl, pulled him out, Carl swung at him. They brought him down to the Hall of Justice down on Kearney Street, 
And I was over in Berkeley when it happened, but Will Edda's his wife knew where I was. She called me and I came right over here and got him out of jail. Well, another time he was un unloading a lot of Christmas, uh, Christmas presents he had at his office on Fillmore Street. And I guess the cop thought that this black man in this nice looking car, because all he had was a Chevrolet, li li thought he, he was a thief or something, some sort of a unlawful acts he's doing. So I was asking where he get all those packages. He said, they're Christmas gifts. He says, it's none of your damn business what they are anyway. So when they arrested him that first time, the cop didn't show up down in Judge Matt Brady's court the next day, Monday. Because he found out who Goodlett was, I guess. He didn't show up because the only witness he had, so the courtroom was full of people there. Well, uh, Tom Lynch was the, he was the chief assistant to Pat Brown then. And uh, I was working in the DA's office because the paper still wasn't making enough money to pay me. And Pat Brown was kind of <laughs> good enough to give me a job. I came to work at five every evening and got off at eight the next morning. Well, what they did then, they kept the, the complaint office in the district attorney's office open. San Francisco County was the only county in the state where the district attorney took the bail. Every other county in the state, the courts took the bail. Well, I had learned very fast that because the first night I started working on that old hall of justice on Kearney Street, every one of the bail brokers came by and gave me $10. I said, what's this? I didn't question them, but that's what I said to myself. Well, we looked down the list and every time somebody got arrested and their friends wanted to get them out, friends or relatives, the cops would all tell them, go down to the district attorney's office on Kearney Street. They'd come in and ask us. We'd find out what, what the charges were, call up in the prison or call out the station if they're still out the station to find out what the bail was called. If, we, if it was a felony, the judge had to set the amount of bail. All the misdemeanors, the bail was standard. You knew what that was. So I remember many a night, if it was a felony, I'd call up some, some municipal court judge. He says, uh, I said, I said, the, 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 I said, the people said the man's got a good job, uh, Judge. He's buying, buying a home here. I says, uh, I don't think he's going to run. So he says, how much do you think it should be? Well, I'd tell him what the, uh, the amount was. It's never over $5,000. And, of course, the bail bond brokers, you know what his fee was. $5,000 bail, I think, was $500. Well... They gave me $50, or whoever was working there. Even, even the deputy district attorney was taking that money. Well, one of them asked me, says, uh, says uh, uh, another thing I found out you do uh, when I was working at D's, every, everybody who was going to have some connection with the court was fixing traffic tickets. Well, I was the only black down there who uh, had that entree, so I started fixing uh, tickets for people that I knew. <laughs> I'll take him to old Judge Matt Brady. He was, he was generally drunk up there on the bench. <laughs> and, and, and the judge said, do you know these people, Tom? I said, sure I know them. I said, they got good jobs. <laughs> He'd write on there, SS, suspended sentence. That's what it meant, a DS, discharge, and then sign his name. Well, it was all over with. Well, I really liked that job because... Uh, <laughs> Because I was, make, I was picking up probably about, well, averaging probably around $300 a month off that bail, and the city was only paying two seventy-five. dollars <laughs> 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 But they, they took it away. They, they, they made San Francisco like the other counties in the state. Uh, the courts took it over. They, they got rid of that part, and, and uh, that's when I, I left the DA's office and came to work for the for the paper full time because I, at least by then, I could earn about $50 a week, which uh, most of the, uh, many of the reporters on the daily papers at that time could only earn about $65 a week. I know how it was for them, too. Uh, Thomas, uh, around 1963 or 64, that's when you say the civil rights movement started in San Francisco. Would you say that the, um, demonstrations against the Palace Hotel and Auto Row were the real beginnings here? That's when you started having the demonstrations at that period. Uh, 
uh, good of the service, two consecutive terms as the president of the NAACP before this period started. And then in between him came, uh, I think, uh, Terry Francois and, and I think Cecil Poole served as president too. And uh, then that Burbage, Dr. Thomas N. Burbage, he, uh, very bright young guy, he was the, uh, got his doctorate here in, in medicine up at, 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 at the University of California Medical Hospital here, a school here. And on top of that, he got another doctorate in, in, in uh, pharmacology. Well, Max didn't, uh, 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 Nat didn't mix too much with the general public like he did later on. And it looked like most people didn't know the fire that, they, uh, that was, in, was, was within his body. They didn't know that he was fire as he was. Because I, uh, Terry Francois had, had grew up with him down in, in, in New Orleans, and Terry thought he could handle him, that he would be the president indeed. So Nat, Nat was elected, and that's when it started then, really started. Of course, all other presidents had similar problems, but they weren't doing it the same way they, they were doing it in the period you talk about. We were, NAACP has always pre, uh, protested racism in this country. They always saw equal rights. That was their, 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 their primary reason for being in an organization, it looked like to me. So uh, they decided they go, uh, the blacks, they didn't have any blacks working in the big hotels here. So they picked the, 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 the palace out as a target. And they, they got uh, farm pickets to march up in front of the hotel protesting their non-employment of blacks in any capacity. Well, uh, Terry Francois was supposed to be one of the lawyers for the NAACP. Then he came over to Nat's house one day and said, you let those kids go into the into the lobby of that hotel. You say I'm not going to def defend you. Well, Terry forgot there were a lot of good liberal lawyers here in, in San Francisco, like Charlie Gary and uh, and his partner and, and many others. The Hallinans were very liberal in at that time, and and and, and there were a lot of them. So uh, uh, they went in one night, and of course the, the cops made the buses. Well, I went down there the next day and I told Nat, I said, I can get you OR. I said, you don't have to put up any bail. He says, if, if they OR all these kids too, I'll take the OR to get out. That's a, a order, a, a, you know, your own recognition why they let you out of, out, of, out of jail. So I admired him for that. And uh, so they finally let them all out, OR all of them. I think they arrested about, about 50, 60. And the radical part of that, you know who most of those demonstrators was down on that picket line? They were white students from San Francisco State and University of California. I was surprised when I didn't see many blacks out there on that line. Those are the ones who followed that. And then, uh, of course, you know, Auto Row came later on after that, where they, you know, they, they, they demonstrated out there in front of it until Cadillac had decided to hire a black salesman. And uh, and that went off and on because uh, during that period in the sixties and two, that, that's the time when they had a, a, a sort of minor riot. Yeah, it was right after that big the big thing down in, in Los Angeles, when they did have a big riot down there. Show you how active Nat was. A sixteen-year-old kid stole a car out in in in, in, uh, in Hunters Point area and went joyriding with another kid. Well, the cops got it on the radio and they started pursuing him. When he got out there where there's a, a lot of vacant land out there, he jumped out of the car and started running across the field. Well, the, one of the cops jumped out and pulled a gun and hollered, Hulk. Instead of just firing up in the air, he fired and hit him, killed the kid. Well, those kids were going bonkers out there that afternoon out at Hunters, Hunters Point. Nat came out of the paper office. He said, I think you and I, you and I ought to go out there and take a look. So we went out there and see, we saw a lot of angry young black males out there on the streets. And uh, they were talking about they want to see the mayor. So Nat went in and called Jack Shelley, who was the mayor then. And 
and told him he thought it was time for him to come out there and talk to the kids. They refused to come. The mayor refused to come. So uh, Matt told me when he brought me back by the paper, the paper office, he said, we might have to come out here again this evening. Well, sure enough, around about 6 o'clock, he called me and said, I think we ought to go out there because it had started what they call a riot. And those kids had started turning over cars out there and setting them on fire or breaking plate glass windows. We went out there, and when we stopped at, at, at a Petrera police station. We got in the police station. Jack Shelley was there, the mayor. Tom Kay, who was chief of police, was there. <laughs> the district attorney was there. So when Nat walked in, the mayor turned and looked at him. And Nat said, don't turn and look at me. So I, 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 I advise you to come out here this afternoon and talk to the kids, and you wouldn't come. <coughs> so the kids kept demanding, at least that's what we heard anyway, that they wanted the mayor to come over to that old opera house out there on 3rd Street. Well, we went over there with the mayor and, and, and uh, all of his party. The mayor went in and got on the stage and he got on those kids and started throwing eggs at him and vegetables. <laughs> and cursed him very loudly. They didn't give him a chance to say anything. Because right out there in front of that place, uh, uh, there was two automobiles overturned on fire. So I said, man, this is going to be a tough night. So we came back over to the police station. And we heard uh, Shelley had called Pat Brown. He was governor then. <coughs> and he better come down here. And Brown said he, he would meet us at the Hall of Justice, everybody. So we got there. <coughs> and the governor came in about 11 o'clock that night. Call out the National Guard. So I told Nat, look like we're going to have a long night. I said, we, be, we better go out there in all areas of San Francisco and warn those kids if those guardsmen come along and tell you to move and get off the streets and move. I said, because the, most of them guardsmen are young kids, and I said, they're crazy. That's like you are. And I said, when they shoot, shoot to kill. Well, sure enough, the guard, I think, started, uh, started patrolling the streets of San, San Francisco with a 30 caliber machine gun mounted up in the, in the back of that Jeep, and two, two men in each, each Jeep. So we started doing what we said we were going to do, we started telling those kids, if they tell you to get off the streets, get off. Don't argue with them. We went out to Sunnydale, did the same thing, go over the Jeeps was out there too. Went over on Hate Street, they would do it. We warned them the same way, and along Fillmore Street. So. Uh, and then, of course, the other events, I can't recall all of them happened. I'm telling you about the things that happened during that period in the 60s when the, when the Civil Rights Movement uh, not only gripped San Francisco, but it gripped all of the United States because, as you know, the Civil Rights Movement produced Martin Luther King and uh, uh, many others whose names I've probably forgotten and probably you've forgotten, too. And, uh, and at, that, at that time, how I felt, I felt that we were really going to go have a change then. Because I saw the black and white kids moving together, going down south on those bus rides and everything, those, those things like that. I said, there are going to be some changes here. But I was just fooling myself because we're still undergoing the same fight. Well, Thomas, in what way do you think things have improved for African Americans here in California since you started the reporter in 1944. Well, I see blacks working in, in, in more places. And of course, you must realize the black population is about four times the size it was it was then in those days. Because uh, I tell you, in 1940, there wasn't 5,000 blacks living in San Francisco. There were more blacks living in, in Berkeley and Oakland than there was in San Francisco in the 1940 census. So the black population over here was always always been smaller than Oakland's, and I I imagine the reason for that because Oakland was a railroad terminal. If it, none of you don't know it, all the transcontinental trains came into Oakland. They did not come to San Francisco. They came to San Francisco. I mean in Oakland. You got off with the o Oakland Mail, got on the ferry, and the ferry brought you over here to San Francisco. Those trains did not come in here. The only train that came in here was a uh, trans you could say it was transcontinental was the Sunset Limited. 
that operated between New Orleans and San Francisco, because that the sunset didn't come in Oakland. It came, you know, through San Jose and came in under San Francisco. So Oakland was a big, because uh, uh, blacks not only work on, on, for the Pullman Company on the sleeping cars, but they work for the Southern Pacific, the Western Pacific, and the Santa Fe. And uh, then the, in the maintenance yards, they, you know, for keeping all those trains up and things. There were a lot of blacks working in the, in the yards. The Pullman Company had their, their repair yards out in Richmond. They employed quite a few blacks out in Richmond. So uh, uh, Oakland really was a big, except for, uh, uh, you know, sea trade. In those days, all the ships docked over, over on this side of the bay. I never did understand why the city fathers let, let that shipping get away from here and go over to Oakland. I never did understand that. That didn't, uh, isn't quite clear to me yet why that happened. But Oakland, uh, Oakland uh, started building those types of pairs for those, those uh, container ships. They didn't build any over here. In uh, 1944, or let's say in the early 40s, what was the situation if, let's say, a black person wanted to uh, go to a restaurant in San Francisco or, or sleep in a hotel or get a, a job working for the city? How have those things changed since then? There was a, up until about 1944, I knew one black, two blacks where it was on the city payroll. I said that I know. Walter Sanford was the, was the receptionist in the mayor's office. Floyd Green was working as a social, uh, psychiatric social worker out of San Francisco General Hospital. Those were the only two I knew of. As I said, Josephine, uh, Cole was working over here teaching, but she was working in the parochial school when she first started. But the, the public school system wasn't hiring then, not any of us, when she got her job. And when did that change? Well, there was a manpower sh uh, shortage developed during the war, you know, and, and the muni started hiring blacks. They had to hire them. And then a lot of other places, the industry started hiring blacks here. And, uh, and now I, I notice when I go down in the financial district, I notice quite a few blacks coming out of those tall office buildings down there. I didn't see that back in the 30s and the 40s. I can tell you that, I didn't see it. Well, many times I've walked down Market Street and the only black face I could see is looking at them plate glass windows and looking at my reflection. That's <laughs> all I saw down there. And you talking about public accommodations. There was one man here who had a lot of money. I imagine most of you here have heard of the Feeling Buildings down on a town on Market Street. That was built by a man who was a former mayor of San Francisco named James Feeling. He went on and was elected United States Senator. Senator Feeling on a 12,000 acre ranch right out of Chico where I used to do a lot of hunting and fishing on there when I was growing up. He had another 12,000 acre ranch down there right out of Gridley, about 22 miles south of Chico along the Sacramento River. Phelan never married. He had a, a, a nephew and a niece. When he died, they inherited everything, including a big mansion down at, at uh, Carmel and a big mansion up on Telegraph Avenue. The nephew's name was Noel Sullivan. He, he thought he had, could sing, sing, but he couldn't sing. But he liked the, he was a, a patron of the arts. And uh, when Lang, how I met him, well, what happened, being a patron of the arts, people like Marion Anderson, Paul Robeson, Roland Hayes, couldn't get a hotel down here. They stayed at his, his mansion out there on, 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 tele, on Telegraph Hill. That's where they stayed. When Langston Hughes came here, that's where he stayed. I first met Langston over the Sweets Ballroom over in Oakland. Jimmy Lunsford, I guess a lot of you have heard Jimmy Lunsford. He had one of the best dance bands in the business. And even over then, when, when Ellington and all of them played Oakland, they played one night for blacks and one night for whites. <laughs> That's the way it was then. And uh, I met Mason Robeson at this night, the night there when Jimmy Lunsford was playing. 
And he, he asked me, say, you met Lang Hughes yet? He was with him. I said, no. So I had a dude, he was a very affable little guy. And the first thing he asked me, he said, you, did you know that, uh, that Bautista, the dictator that Fidel drove out of Canada, said, did you know he's black? I said, no, I didn't. He said, well, he is. <laughs> he invited me over there. I, I went, went by, by Sullivan's house several times when Langston Hughes was staying there. I remember the first night I met, met, met Sullivan, I told him, I said, I fished on your, your ranch and hunted on your ranch a lot up there in Chico. He said, yes, my man Murphy's a good farmer. And I said, I knew him for uh, Murphy. I said, that's why I, get, I was able to get on that fish and hunt on there. So, uh, uh, but he made, uh, made it comfortable for most of the black artists who came through here. I'm talking about the, the, the internationally known ones. That's where they stayed, up there at his place. Because none of the hotels down here would hire here. I, I think some of us can remember who was around here then when uh, there was a Dr. Nelson came up here from Los Angeles. This thing was black surgeon now, and he'd married a, a Ziegfeld Folly Showgirls. You know, a lot of big men like to marry showgirls in those days, back in the 20s. And he met, he came up here from Los Angeles, got reservations. And when he and his wife came into the, 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 uh, the St. Francis, the clerk looked at him and he asked us, could I help? He said, yes, he said, I got reservations. I got it confirmed by mail. He said, we don't have that here. That's what happened to him. Which was a heck of an insult for a man to come up here with his bride to, to stay in San Francisco a uh, 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 part of his honeymoon. And when did that policy change, Thomas? I think it started in the, in the war years because I noticed that there a lot of a lot of black war correspondents came through here. Even some of the black newspapers were sending correspondents over in the Pacific because what I met was Charlie. Uh, I forgot Charlie's last name, but he, he worked for that big black daily paper in in in, uh, in Cleveland. He was going over to the Pacific area, and he stayed in a hotel here, I think to Mark Hopkins. And that's the first time I heard of it then. That was around about 1944 then, when I first heard that. And I think there were a lot of black officers coming through here, you know, from lieutenants on up to a higher level as they went in those days. It was very hard for them to refuse them, you know, accommodations when they came through here, although they didn't find it too hard uh, uh, the refused enlisted men because I remember when I was uh, in basic training in uh, Fort Leonard Wood, they had one big PX there. They had a little dumpy place over there for blacks to stay in. So I went into the big PX one night because they had booths of telephones all alone. Over in the black, that little place they had for black, they had two telephone booths in there because I used to call my mother all the time. And I know it was hopeless, you know, to go in there, there, there for the black only. And then, uh, you know, they shipped over a lot of Italian prisoners of war that they had captured in North Africa. They sent them over here to the United States. They were going in PX number one. The German prisoners, they, have, they were going in PX 81. So I went marched in there one night. So the girl there told, said, well, you can't come in here. I said, what do you mean I can't come in here? I said, I'm wearing the uniform of the United States Army. And I said, I'm getting ready. They're probably going to send me over there to face the Germans or the Japanese. Might, might get shot. Save your butt. <laughs> so uh, she called an MP. They took me outside, told me to go to the colored area. And I saw them Italian prisoners of war going in there, and the German prisoners of war going in there. But I couldn't go in there with the uniform on. Well, Thomas, I know that some of your stories, they kind of end like that, where you, you tell what you tried to do, but you didn't have any success. But um, just to uh, move ahead, let me say two words. Jim Jones, what are your memories of him? When Jim first had a church, church up at Ukiah, we noticed that we had heard uh, coming to the paper about a lot of blacks were going uh, uh, up to Ukiah for Sunday services. 
Well, I later learned also that a lot of black ministers down here was very unhappy because they were losing, losing some of their flocks. He finally came down here, that's when I met him. And I went over there and had, uh, had some meals over there. Gillett went over there. In fact, Diane Feinstein went over there for lunch. And, and so did uh, Ro Rosalind Carter when she came through here. She went over there and ate over there. I liked the program they had over there, although I thought, I thought, Jim, I thought Jim had some head problems then. Because he used to call me up every once in a while and tell me about they had received, he had received threatening letters at you know, the temple they had over there on, on, on uh, Gary Boulevard, either by mail or telephone. So I said, Jim, I said, you don't know who they are. I said, we get threatening letters here at the paper. And I said, I assume that the Chronicle Examiner gets the same thing every once in a while. I said, you just got to learn to roll with the punch, that's all. And then I saw the, the program, uh, the, the dormitory service they had for a lot of people there. He had created, created a new way for, for them to live, and I, 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 they might have been very lonely before they came there. They had that nursery there for working mothers, and they had a little clinic in there. And uh, I thought it was good, because I didn't, I didn't know uh, about what was going on within the church. And uh, so he finally went over to Guyana. Well, I remember after he went to Guyana, Eleanor Oman, who was here, she was, she was Dr. Goodall's uh, uh, confidential secretary. Eleanor and I was invited to lunch over there, uh, I mean dinner one night. And Jim had a short range uh, wave radio station there in the church. So they called him over there and told him I was in the church. So he had, had told him to tell me to come and he wanted to talk to me. So I went up there and he said, I'd like for you to come down here and do a story on, on, uh, on the colony down here. And I said, well, Jim, I said, uh, I got a better idea than me coming down there. I had a friend, she's a friend of goodness too. She's a, a good photographer. She does work for, for television stations. I said, I got a friend here who's a, a, a camera person. I said, uh, man, I said, that would be better if she would come down there. I said, it'd probably get on, on Channel 9. And he said, how much would it cost? I said, well, I'll talk to her. He said, well, I'll get back to you later on. I think a few days later, Eleanor, wasn't it a few days later after we were over there, the, 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 the mass suicide occurred? Wasn't very far away from there. And of course, <laughs> Terry Francois thought we were responsible for it, for not exposing Jones. <laughs> he got, came by the paper office one day and Started yelling soon as he walked in the office. I said, I don't want to hear that noise. I said, you stay out there on the sidewalk. And he said, I want to talk to Carlton. And I said, well, if Carlton wants to talk to you, he will. So uh, he went out and found some, some wino somewhere, and they hastily made some placards, you know, and brought them over there saying that we were responsible. He said, we should have informed the community about what was going over at the church. I said, I didn't know any more about what was going on in that church than I do in the other church. I said, one thing, I don't go to church. <laughs> and I said, what them people do in the church is their own business. It ain't mine. And uh, so uh, then Goodlett finally came out there, and we'd give him a year, a Man of the Year award. It was a watch. He said, give it back to Goodlett. He said, thing to quit running anyway. Well, after that mass suicide uh, took place, or some people say it was partially a murder, then where did you hear the news about it, and what happened right afterwards? I heard it, heard it over the news. I forgot what part, which media, either the newspapers or, or television. I listen to television news every night. I've been doing it. I read four daily, daily newspapers every day. I've been doing that for about 30 years. I read the New York Times every day, the Oakland Tribune, and the Chronicle and Examiner. And what happened to the temple immediately after the mass suicide? Did well, you I wasn't a member, but I, you mean right after doing that period? Yes. Well, I went over there to see what was going on because they, they wouldn't let the media in the, you know, in, in the temple. And of course, the cops were inside. I, I forgot the police captain who was inside the temple. And so uh, 
I told him, I said, I think you ought to let, let at least one media person come in here and take a look. Because rumors were going around that there had been some suicides in the church, too. So the captain said, you think that's correct? I said, I think it's the best thing for you to do. He says, well, I'll let in one. He said, you can pick the one. So I went outside with, with one of the temple people, and I picked uh, Susan's ward out. She's still writing for the Chronicle. I picked Susan out to come out because I knew her. She came in, went, made the investigation, come out and told other reporters what, what it was like inside. And looking back, do you think Jim Jones was really evil incarnate? I don't think he was evil. I think he was a little daffy. Because, <laughs> you know, you know Gullet went down to visit him. Gullet looked at that little clinic they had there in Jonestown, and he saw it was very inadequate. He tried to get him to go into Joan, uh, what's the capital city now in Georgetown, isn't it? Tried to get him to go into Georgetown and go in the hospital, and he refused to go. Do you think then that uh, people have reason to hate Jim Jones now, or do you think that he did anything which is still remaining? I thought he did a lot of good for, for a lot of people who were very lost people. And whatever happened down there, those people, nobody forced them to go into that organization. Nobody did. They went in there on their own will, and that's their business, period. That's quite an alternative viewpoint than we got in the press on this last uh, 20th anniversary. Daphne just gave me a note saying 10 minutes, or about five minutes ago. Daphne, does that mean that we have uh, time for a few questions? Or OK. All right. Uh, if we have a few minutes left, I'd like to ask you about Willie Brown. When did you first meet Willie Brown? And did you think right then that he had these leadership abilities that he's shown since then? I, I didn't think of it that way. I know he had uh, a winning personality. I guess you could use that term because I I met Willie one night at a liquor store at the corner of Fillmore, California. They used to call that the the town the town gossip place because when that, they, that place closed up late at night, uh, the clerks would let. Let me and, and some other people he knew who was becoming it, and we would open a bottle back in the back, not up in the front part. And uh, and some guys who were two of the collection and we were going to San Francisco State at the time. They 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 brought Willie over there, and I met him, and I I kind of like his personality. And uh, and when he said he was going to intend to go law to law school, I I thought that was good too. Uh, I think Willie's a, one of the smartest politicians that ever occupied the mayor seat in San Francisco. I remember I asked him right after he was elected to office. I said, Willie, I said, Sam, Sam Rayburn's from Texas. I says, uh, Jack Garner's from Texas. And I said, then there's Lyndon Johnson. I said, all of those uh, uh, Texas politicians knew how to exert political power. I said, now there's you. I said, what kind of water do you catch drink down in Texas? He said, branch water and bourbon whiskey. <laughs> Was uh, Willie Brown's uncle very well known in the black community here? I guess among those people who frankly the gambling club, clubs, I, I never did go to the gambling clubs because I, I, I always thought there's a better way I could spend my money. But I, I, I met Willie's uncle before I did him. And since Willie, and he sent for Willie to come out when Willie graduated from high school. Since Willie Brown has become mayor, he's had a lot of triumphs and and also some things people are criticizing him for. How do you think he's handling the homeless situation here? I think he's handling handling it the best way he can. I think the homeless pro problem is a national problem. Because I can't ever forget the WPA days. It was the federal government that came in there and fed all them hungry people out there then. And it's going to have to be the state government or the federal government, either one, to do it again. Because I don't think any city can do it by itself. And if you want my, my real answer, I think the whole system has got to turn socials, socialism. I think we all, if we want to survive. Would you say that there's still a need for a black press here in San Francisco? 
without a doubt, not only in San Francisco, all over, all over the nation. And what can the black press offer that you can't get from the so-called mainstream press? What can it offer the mainstream press? Well, the mainstream press, the only way it has changed, they hire more blacks there now than they did a long time ago. I, uh, they didn't start hiring blacks in San Francisco, I think, till the late 40s or early 50s. They didn't have any working over here. There's one instance where Oakland was ahead of us. <laughs> Old Joe Nolan, as reactionary as he was, hired a black woman back there, when, and she was working at the Oakland Tribune when I came here in 1926. It was just a weekly column called Activities Among Negroes. But there wasn't any other people around here doing anything about, about uh, where, as, as far as blacks are concerned. And Oakland was ahead of San Francisco then also in, in other ways. They had a black fire company over there, and a, a black better not even apply uh, to be a, a, a cop or a fireman over here. That was the difference then. Of course, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, Oakland, uh, I don't know what's happened over there, the political and business leadership. I, they, they, they kind of bewilder me at times. Because the way they give money away to Al Davis over there, they act like they're insane over there. <laughs> well, I, th I think that wraps it up for your regular presentation. But Daphne, do you say you're going to let people ask questions now? Yes. Um, if you have questions, please raise your hand. I have a uh, portable microphone. So Yeah, can uh, you tell me what you remember about the Port Chicago disaster during World War II? The reporter hadn't been open very long when that happened. I, I, I never went down there because I had, didn't have transportation to, you know, to, to take a first-hand look. So all I could do is read uh, in, the, uh, in the other papers and try to make a, you know, make a composite uh, a uh, story about what I got from other other uh, media here in, locally. I never went down there, but I uh, and from the things I've heard, I don't. I I think the I don't th think the government should have had those young kids down there unloading that ammunition down there who didn't have the training that the professional longshoreman had about handling that type of cargo. And uh, I did. I did write an editorial based on that about that. About why I put these uh, 19 and 18 year old kids on there. And the, but I've talked to you know uh, Dr. Dr. Burbage was a was a seaman. Most of those most most of those uh, uh, people there who were uh, working in Chicago and Port Chicago, they slept in barracks at Mary Allen. Dr. Burbage hadn't entered medical college. He was a sailor over there at Maryland then. He just missed it by one day. He, might, he would have been on there too. Hi, Tom. I'd like to know uh, in the days of um, Miss Baker from France, came over from France, you and her played a role in integrating the key system at that time, I believe. What was her name, the dancer? Josephine, Josephine Baker. Baker. What part or what role did the two of you play? Well, uh, uh, the, the first, first shot that Joe, that Joe took was the key system. They still hadn't hired any blacks because I went over there with her that time. And she told uh, the, the, the brass over there at, at the key system that if blacks can drive those big army rigs, they can drive buses. And of course, none of them liked it, but uh, she, that's, that's the contribution she made. Because seeing Goodlett became very friendly and when Goodlett went to the World's Fair, the one in Brussels, I think in the, in the late 50s. You remember the year, Eleanor? Was it 55? Yeah. That's when Goodlett met her. You know, she had all those, those orphans. You know, uh, she had about 24 kids that she had adopted, was keeping them in this big place, and she was having some, some, some problems, you know, keeping it together. When, when Carl came back here, he started sending her I forgot how much, but he sent her money every month. The young man who was with him, who's a dentist, who's practicing uh, dentistry down in Bakerfield, started sending her money also every month. Because when they, she first came here, you know, she, she appeared at the theater here when she came back. 
The first place she came was by the sun reporter, uh, by the reporter office. That's where she came. Uh, hello, thank you. This, you this, this whole afternoon has been really wonderful. I wanted to ask some questions about uh, Jonestown. I understand the evaluation, your evaluation of Mr. Reverend, uh, former Reverend Jim Jones, and I agree with your evaluation. But what, were your, what was your evaluation of the, his advisors and the people around him? I have trouble hearing. I wish you would repeat that over again. Okay. See if you can catch what she's saying. Okay. Okay. No, the I I, I, maybe I can say. The question, Thomas, was what did you think of the advisors who were around Jim Jones? Did you meet any of them? I don't know who was an advisor there. <laughs> I really don't know who was an advisor to Jim Jones because I looked over the, you know, the, the clinic that they had there in, in the nursery. I looked it over. I guess those people who were uh, conducting those activities were staff people. I know one thing, uh, if uh, you, 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 I don't know whether you know the Richardsons are on uh, Marcus Bookstore. Well, Ray Richardson's sister was one of those went over there and took her lap, but the way Ray looked at it, she says, I think my sister did what she wanted to do. She didn't blame Jim Jones, because she thinks he did, had nothing to do with her sister taking her life. Um, where, uh, sir, where, where's the most complete archive of the complete issues of the Sun Reporter for research purposes? Because I believe the library doesn't have it here. What did she say? Uh, she asked where the uh, most of the back issues of the Sun Reporter can be found. <laughs> Fortunately, we've been very careless, very dumb either one. The first, the first, I think about the first 20 years, we, uh, we bound them. You know, that addition for each year? And then we quit doing it, and then, then that, uh, a lot of people come by and, and borrowed those bound volumes, and they didn't bring them back. I think if you want to find a lot of back issues of the Sun Reporter, I think you'd have to go to Bancroft Library. They'd probably have better service than we would have over here. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Fleming. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>